All right. So welcome to Cancer Bridges General Weekly Support Group. Uh, I am Wendy Myers, and uh, we are joined tonight by my student, Kara Dillaway. Kara is a second year MSW student at the University of Pittsburgh. Currently, she is offering a short term supportive counseling. She's offering short term supportive counseling at Cancer Bridges for her internship. She graduated from Boston University in 2016 with a major in psychology. Since then, she has worked in research studying motivational behavior and people with various mental health disorders and in a private practice offering neuropsychology testing. This work has taught her that she has a strong interest in working directly with people and forming therapeutic relationships. Um, she looks forward to earning her LCSW and offering therapy full time. And um, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm proud to announce that she got her job actually. So I'll let her share that with the specifics about that with you guys, but um, really happy that she's gonna be starting a job in May. Tonight, we talked about what topic she wants to you know, discuss. So this is a very interesting topic to us because everybody goes through grief in our life, many different facets of grief. And she chose the topic of disenfranchised grief. Um, cancer diagnosis, she writes, can bring about feelings of loss for everyone involved. However, not all of these situations are recognized by society. So join us, so she's, you know, we're joining her to talk about how to navigate this stigmatized and devalued loss. So with that intro, I welcome Kara. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, so um, I am going to be talking about disenfranchised grief. As Wendy mentioned, um, I'll be at Cancer Bridges for the next couple of weeks up until mid-May, um, and then I'll be over at Southwestern Human Services as an outpatient therapist there. So Maybe I'll see some of you there. <laughs> so I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay. All right, so disenfranchised grief. So this was actually a term that was coined by Dr. Ken Doka. Um, he introduced the idea of this type of grief. And the definition is it's a grief that people experience when they incur a loss that is not socially sanctioned, acknowledged, or publicly mourned. Um, it's when society denies our need, right, role, or capacity to grieve. Okay, so just to expand on that a little bit, it's basically when the individual does not receive the right to, of the grieving role. Um, however, that person is in fact experiencing a grief reaction, despite society not really recognizing it. Um, it's still a very real experience of grief. Um, that little picture there, just a little quote that says, when life brings situations in grief that you are afraid to share with others. So it's really those situations where some, some type of loss has happened, um, but perhaps society doesn't see it as important or it's not recognized. Um, and I think this happens a lot with a cancer diagnosis. There's a lot of loss involved with cancer, but it can also happen in a lot of other situations. And, um, I think that's important to mention too. So a lot of things I'm going to talk about in here are things that might not necessarily be related to cancer, but things that just we as humans experience through grief. Okay. So when you're experiencing this type of grief, you're not afforded the following. Um, you don't get time off from work. Um, you don't have a decrease in responsibilities. There's no public support. And basically there's no Hallmark card. You know, you don't go to the store and find a card that recognizes this type of grief. Um, so oftentimes you'll still have to go to work or school um, and it can seem impossible to focus. Um, in terms of health, perhaps you do stay home from work, but maybe this is a loss in itself. Um, additionally, um, personal responsibilities will still exist. So for example, maybe caring for kids, taking care of yourself, um, maybe just even making food, showering, sleep, those type of basic things might seem difficult during grief. And it's even trickier when there's no public support or acknowledgement. Okay, so a surprisingly large number of life's events go ungrieved in our futile attempt to get on with life or to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. 
So these events, which can be disavowed, may include some of the following. So this is where we kind of get into examples of disenfranchised grief. So maybe a divorce um, for spouses, children, and the family unit. Those are all affected in different ways. Um, and these divorce specifically might be seen as a like taboo or topic that other people want to avoid or just not bring up in general. Life transitions, so maybe moving, um, receiving a medical diagnosis, starting a new career. These aren't really recognized publicly oftentimes. Um, loss of a job, um, youth, children in the home, retirement. So this is kind of on the opposite end here of starting a new career. Maybe there's a loss of a job. Um, and this might be by choice or not. And that too plays a role in the grief reaction if maybe this was something you chose or not. Dysfunction in the home, loss of family life. Um, dysfunction in home occurs when there are role changes. So if someone's becoming a caregiver or perhaps there's a loss and an individual feels the need to kind of assume the role of the person who has passed. Um, lost childhood, lost security, constant abandonment, loss of parents who were able to behave like parents. So this is when a child kind of has to grow up quickly and kind of lose out on childhood. And loss of a period of one's own life, loss of potential, what might have been. I think a cancer diagnosis relates to this one heavily and it goes back to kind of adjusting to a new normal. Okay. So if we can't mourn our losses, we may experiencing, experience one or all of the following reactions. So these are some of the consequences of disenfranchised grief. You may stay stuck in anger, pain, and resentment. You might lose access to important parts of our inner feeling world. Um, you might have trouble engaging in new relationships because you're still engaged in an active relationship with a person or a situation that's no longer present. Um, you might project unfelt, unresolved grief onto a new situation, placing those feelings where they don't belong. You might lose personal history along with the unmourned person or situation as part of us dies too. Or you may carry deep fears of subsequent abandonment. So if you aren't properly able to express your emotions of this grief, it can get bottled up or it can come out in unattended ways. So, and this ultimately might even progress into depression. Okay, so there's five types of disenfranchised grief that Dr. Kandoka established. The first one is when the relationship is not acknowledged. So this might be the loss of someone that you're having an affair with or an ex-spouse, um, the loss of a teacher or a coach. Oftentimes people just assume that you're not close enough with this person to grieve them heavily. Um, the second type of disenfranchised grief is loss, but when the loss itself is not recognized. So for example, death is not the only form of grief. Um, there's lots of types of losses that we've kind of mentioned already and that we'll talk about more, but a lot of times when people think grief, they just automatically assume death. Um, number three is the, when the griever is not acknowledged. So for example, if the griever has a disability, or perhaps if they're very young or very old, they might be ignored because people assume they don't know what's going on fully. And if they think this person doesn't fully understand the situation, then they're not sad about it or they don't care. Number four is when the death is stigmatized. So suicide or addiction often fit into this category um, or deaths where mental health is a factor. Um, one example I read about was um, when a woman's son died, but the son was robbing a bank. So maybe society says in that situation, he deserved it and he was bad. Um, in terms of cancer related, maybe lung cancer. Well, if they were a smoker, maybe they got what they deserved or they were asked for it by smoking. And the last one, the person's grief does not fit within societal norms. So this happens a lot with cultural differences in grief. So an example of that maybe culturally, some people um, find it inappropriate to cry openly um, or the opposite, maintaining composure. 
Okay. I'm gonna go into some more depth of some of these types. Um, so for the first one specifically about relationships, um, some other disenfranchised relationships that take place, um, caregivers. Um, I think this is particularly disenfranchised often when it's not a family member that you were caring for. Um, maybe if it's your job to be a caregiver, then society might say it's just a job. And, and this is the case, if it's a job, a lot of times you get assigned to someone new and then multiple losses are involved. So that's something where the individual has to kind of learn how to deal with that emotionally. Um, and that person can be at risk for more complicated or unresolved grief. Um, other examples include having a same-sex partner, um, ex-in-law, or online relationships. Um, I thought that one was interesting. And because that one has become more frequent after COVID, especially yeah. online virtual or people are making more online connections but society sometimes thinks like oh, these aren't real connections or these aren't close connections because they're not in person um so society often interprets the relationship as distant and therefore not worthy of grief okay and then just going some more detail about the stigmatized dead so this is when a situation where character or actions of the, the deceased disenfranchises the death. I just want to clarify that stigma specifically is an invisible or visible mark that kind of mars someone's character. Um, certain diseases that can be perceived or caused by actions or failures to act by the deceased may inhibit support. So I mentioned before the lung cancer, did they smoke? Another good example is COVID, um, especially early on when the first people were first getting diagnosed um, or when the um, vaccine came out or a lot of blame was put on, well, maybe they wouldn't have gotten so sick if they had gotten the vaccine. Um, I think a lot of chronic conditions have lifestyle factors, but not a lot of them carry stigma. So it's just kind of interesting how society interprets different things, different ways. Okay. Another highly disenfranchised grief is miscarriage, infertility, or abortion. Again, this might be a result of cancer or it may be completely separate, but this is a major source of disenfranchised grief because miscarriage is um, one of the most, typed, most common types of pregnancy loss. 15 to 20% of confirmed pregnancies end in miscarriage. Um, and this is when the loss of pregnancy happens on its own within the first 20 weeks. So oftentimes miscarriage and fertility or abortion are seen as like an unspeakable loss that people would rather forget. And that again, leads to unresolved grief. When this happens in teenagers, I think it's especially difficult to discuss because of stigma involved. They don't want other people knowing. Okay, effect on family. Um, this was written kind of in relation to losing a child, but I think it applies in other situations as well. So if a family is going through a devalued loss together, it may seem like something that's unifying, like we all experiencing this loss together, but a lot of times it actually ends up being lonesome. And I think this is because the people in the family are usually different, you know? I mean, everyone's an individual and grieves their own way. Um, I think there's gender differences and I think there's developmental age differences. So everyone's kind of on their own timeline in that sense, which can make it a little bit trickier to navigate. So in addition to that, there's each person has their own ideas of kind of what could have been, um, lost dreams in a way, and some may experience self-blame. So in that example of pregnancy loss, the woman might blame themselves. Um, in an example of divorce, a child might blame themselves. Um, in terms of illness, someone might, anyone could just blame themselves saying like, if I was health, healthier, maybe this wouldn't have happened. Okay, some interventions or rituals to kind of mediate disenfranchised grief. Um, again, this was in relation to um, like pregnancy loss. So it is important for the doctor to recognize this loss. Um, possible to allow to see the fetus, naming the fetus, having a memorial, writing a poem or a letter to the baby, and counseling, I think is very important. 
Um, for abortion specifically, it's best to have counseling before and after to explore feelings, especially guilt. Um, and also it's important to recognize that grief can appear many years later, um, perhaps during menopause or if there's issues with infertility. Okay. Cancer specific devalued emotional losses. So these are some of the emotions that um, often go along with cancer. When you first get diagnosed, I think particularly, but can happen at any time. Um, so first self-perception, you might ask, who am I now? What is my identity? Um, there is that loss of dreams or expectations that what could have been that we mentioned. Um, and then loss of control in life. So these personal emotions are not fully spoken about and there's often a gap between the patient's inner feelings and then the perception of their friends and family. The reactions of family and friends is typically encouraging and trying to provide hope. So there's great difficulty for them to kind of perceive the negative reactions such as depression, anger, lack of appetite, helplessness. Um, and this is particularly true when the physical condition of the patient is stable. So people may wonder, I mean, if you're functioning right now, why aren't you getting out of bed? Or why aren't you going out and doing stuff with us? And it's due to this personal grief and the emotions involved. So I think understanding the emotional process can help to eliminate this gap between the patient and their family and friends. Um, it can increase empathy. And ultimately it leads to the patient being more open and willing to participate in social functions versus isolation. All right, so these are just some other examples of disenfranchised grief. Um, maturation, so just different transitions in life, retirement, that empty nest, if kids are going away to school or if just moving out, um, functional loss, religious conversion, mental illness, substance abuse or recovery, loss of a relationship, um, so particularly one that's non-death or not divorce, maybe just a breakup or a friendship loss. That is um, a big life change that is often not recognized. Um, loss of safety or security and chronic disease or disability. So that last one we have touched on, but I wanted to point it out particularly when it's chronic because it is a lifelong adjustment. Um, others may assume after time has passed that you know everything's okay and that you're used to it or Surely you've adjusted by now, but that's not always the case. And I think especially because new difficulties arise with age or life experiences. Um, so um, can anyone think of any others that might be added on this list? I know we talked about a lot of them. We can circle back to it as well. Just thinking off the top of my head, maybe even loss of a pet. I'm always trying to add to this list. <laughs> All right. And just one last slide here. How to cope. So I think first and foremost, counseling. Um, having someone to talk to who is not biased. Um, but also identifying someone to confide in in your personal life, I think is important. Um, allowing yourself to grieve, finding meaning when possible, and understanding that this is a process. So it's just important to provide acknowledgement and self-validate what you're feeling. Your thoughts and your feelings serve a vital purpose in your healing. So recognizing how you feel today because of the loss and what you need to do to move forward. Allow yourself to be with those feelings without judgment. Grief will look different in different people, so there's no right or wrong. Um, some people want, may want to be more private, while others may make art or memorialize their loss in a more creative or maybe a different meaningful way. Um, but ultimately, healing does not mean that the grief ever goes away. That loss is a part of you forever, but perhaps as you heal, it, it will take up less space as it kind of ebbs and flows throughout the day to day. All right. Any questions, comments? Can you hear me? Yeah. This is Jeff. 
um, I don't know if this is disenfranchised grief or not, but, um, you know, my partner was uh, diagnosed more than a year and a half ago. And, and, you know, it's been a very, a very hard time just dealing with, you know, what the future could hold or might hold with clinical trials and everything else. The one thing that, that is starting to really um, drag on me, particularly because he is starting to be a little bit less able to be independent and, and we don't share a, a living arrangements, but he's coming to live with me finally, which is my big signal that he knows he's not doing well. My big thing is that everybody in my world, and I know they don't do this on purpose, but everybody that I deal with says to me, you have to be strong for him. You have to be the strong one. You must be strong. You must be positive. And I'm starting to really feel like uh, I don't think I can do that. I, I, I don't think I can do that the way people expect me to be doing. And, and uh, people expect me to be a buffer, you know, between the person with the illness and the outside world. And it's hard to be that, to be that, communication and to be that buffer and not admit that you know what I'm I'm grieving for someone who's not gone yet mm -hmm. so yeah. uh, that's something that I, I don't know if that qualifies as disenfranchised grief or not but it just occurred to me that's all yeah I certainly think that is an example of disenfranchised grief because it's a unique situation and there is loss involved and it, I guess it fits under the category of anticipatory grief in a way too. Mm -hmm. um, but no one can be expected to be strong 100% of the time. And, and I think it fits into the categories of what we were talking about too, of allowing yourself that time to grieve and giving yourself that space. I'm going to uh, stop the recording and bring all those back so we can see one another. Sometimes that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay.